Well, please have a seat. I think uh, in future our baptism class needs to include quick changing, doesn't it, as uh, part of the instruction. But w one of the benefits of this new system is I only have to get changed on the bottom half. Um, it it's a great joy uh, to baptise these five, isn't it, this morning. We praise God. And we're going to come now um, to God's Word. Uh, we're continuing our series in the book of Ephesians. Um, and uh, we're going to be looking at Ephesians 2, um, verses 1 to 10. So if you've got a Bible, feel free to, to open that up. Let me pray as we come to God's Word. Father God, we, we give you thanks already uh, for what you have done. Lord, we want to give, praise you this morning. And, and yet, Lord, we long to that now as we come to your Word, you'd speak to us. Lord, we, we pray that your word would penetrate our hearts. We pray, Lord God, that you'd show us more of who you are. Um, we pray, Lord God, that we would see even more clearly the wonders of what you have done in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Lord, we've seen that visibly demonstrated this morning, and we pray now we, we would see that as we come to your word. Uh, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, well, I wanted to start with um, a, a picture. I think there's a picture that might come up. Um, it's a picture of uh, Queen Street Mill Textile Museum, uh, which is near Burnley. Some of you might have been there. Um, <clears throat> and it's, it's one of those kind of, it's an old mill, and they've put money in to kind of restore it, so it's still running. Um, so I, I went with my family quite some time ago, but it made a real impression, because all the machinery was running, and it has a, you know, you really kind of feel the power uh, and the noise of, of all that's going on. And this picture here is of the kind of huge the engine and the flywheel that drives all the machines. Um, now, this flywheel is kind of 14 foot high, so it's this enormous metal uh, uh, wheel, and it spins at 68 RPM, so it's kind of flying round and round. And as you're stood there next to this engine, um, you know, the noise is deafening, and you just kind of feel the power. You're right up there next to it, and you feel that sense that if anything went wrong here, you know, it would get pretty serious. And similarly, just next to that, there's a room full of all the looms, you know, working. And you have to wear kind of ear defenders. Um, what am I, Mustafa? You have to wear ear defenders. It's that loud. You know, when, when you're around power like that, it has an effect on you, doesn't it? I, rem I still remember what it felt like to be stood next to this flywheel. There was a kind of awe at the power. Now, as we've witnessed these five baptisms this morning, we should have had that same awe. You know, as we've, if we've seen Martin and Hamid and Saba and Mazia and, Mazia and Mustafa baptised, we've had a kind of glimpse of the dramatic power of God at work in their lives. But I don't know how you've seen these baptisms this morning. You know, it's, it's easy, isn't it, to see baptisms like some kind of graduation ceremony. You know, like when if you, if you went to, to, with a friend when they get awarded their next belt in karate or something like that. You know, it's, it's nice for them, but... It's not really a big deal for me. It seems fairly kind of standard. Well, the passage we're looking at this morning, as we keep going through the book of Ephesians, says, look, this is far from routine. Actually, what has happened in their lives is the spiritual equivalent of raising the dead. You know, what we're going to see this morning is that becoming a Christian involves God raising the dead. So let's um, turn to Ephesians 2, 1 to 10. I think maybe we can have the light above me again. That'd be great. Um, and I'll read um, from verse 1. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages... He might show the incomparable riches of his grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, 
created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Now we've seen, haven't we, over the last few weeks in, in this letter um, of Ephesians, something of you know, all God has done for us in Jesus. And the letter started by zooming right out, didn't it, to the macro, the kind of Google Earth, God's big plan for humanity. Well, in this passage, it kind of zooms right in to the micro, God's work in the lives of individuals. If you like, we've gone from Google Earth to Google Street View. And, you know, to properly appreciate the significance of an event, we have to understand the starting point, don't we? You know, to to realise the significance of a story, we have to know where things began. So if I can have the next picture up. Some of you might recognise this person. This is Fabrice Mwamba. Um, Here he is um, starting his new role, um, coaching the Rochdale under-16s. Now, that might seem a little bit mundane. Why am I showing that? You know, what's significant about that? There's loads of people, aren't there, coaching football all over the UK. Well, the significance of this story lies in in what happened before and where things started. Some of you all know this. Fabrice Mwamba was a 23-year-old midfielder uh, playing for Bolton Wanderers. And in 2012, he collapsed on the pitch against Tottenham. And he was medically dead for 78 minutes. He was, he was shocked 15 times. You know, doctors were trying to revive him for more than an hour. And incredibly, his, his heart got going again. You see, the significance of that story is in what's happened before. Well, let's have another picture. Um, this is... The, the man in the middle there is Timothy John Weeks, and he's, you know, it's a picture in Australia with his sisters. You know, again, why is that significant? You know, there's all kinds of family portraits in Australia, aren't there? Well, Timothy John Weeks was an Australian teacher, and he was, he was, his, his job was in Afghanistan, in Kabul, um, at the American University of Afghanistan. And in 2016, he was abducted, and he was held captive by the Taliban for three years. And this picture comes shortly after he was released as part of a prisoner exchange. See, again, the significance of the story is in what's gone before. Well, let's have one more. So this um, lady in the, in the front there, in the pink, um, is Asia Bibi. And this is her outside her home in Canada. You know, again, why is that significant? It, it seems very mundane, doesn't it? Well, it's significant because... Um, in 2010, Asia Bibi was convicted of blasphemy in Pakistan and sentenced to death by hanging. Again, many of us would have followed this story. You know, and remarkably, she was um, removed from Pakistan uh, and able to start a, a new life in Canada. So you, you see, you only, we only get the significance, don't we, of these events when we realise how things started. And actually, it's the same with the Christian faith. We will only realise how remarkable it is when people become Christians when we realise what human beings are by nature. So the first thing we see in this passage is that by nature we are spiritually dead. I wonder if someone had said to you, you know, at root, what are human beings like? I wonder what you'd answer. I I think the world around us says things like, you know, human beings are a blank sheet of paper. You know, effectively we're a product of our choices. We're, We're kind of free to choose what we become. Or maybe if pressed, a lot of people would say, look, we're good at the core. You know, you hear people say, don't you? Yeah, underneath they're a good guy. Deep down. Well, the Bible shatters that illusion. In the words we just read, God says clearly that by nature, we're dead, we're enslaved, and we're condemned. So we're dead. We just read, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. And transgression is our kind of active rebellion against God. Sin is our failure to live up to his standards. See, Paul says, because of our rebellion and our failure before God, we're dead. You know, what does he mean? Well, just imagine for a moment someone who um, is born blind. Now, obviously, they're, they're alive, aren't they? But a very significant component of life is missing. Actually, they're unable, in one sense, to enjoy life in all its fullness. Well, our sin and transgression cuts us off from the life of God. And actually, that that is far more fundamental to human existence than sight. You know, the the most fundamental aspects of of what we are as human beings, which is to know God and relate to him, is completely absent. 
by nature. You know, by nature, we're dead to God, spiritually dead. There's no love for God in us. There's no awareness of his reality. We're deaf to his voice. We're blind to his majesty and his glory. You know, someone once said to me, if everything was working properly, whenever we, we see a beautiful sunset, we should automatically give praise to God. But we don't, do we? We just take a photo. With regards to the God who made us, by nature, actually, we're as unresponsive as a corpse. You know, as Fabrice Moamba lay on that football pitch with no heartbeat, there was nothing he could do, was there, to sort his situation out. And spiritually, we're in the same situation. But it gets worse before it gets better. We're dead, we're enslaved. So we, we read there in, in verse 2, I think it is, follow the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Now you might say, look, come on, you know, to say that we're dead is pushing it. Telling us that human beings are all enslaved by nature, you know, surely that's going too far. Well, what are we meant to be enslaved by? Well, the answer in these verses is threefold. The world, the flesh, and the devil. And that, that language might seem a bit old-fashioned, but actually that threefold captivity, that's existed throughout human history. It was true when Paul wrote in the Roman Empire of the first century. It was true in Victorian England, but actually it's true today. We're not the free people we think we are. We follow the ways of this world. You know, we like to think of ourselves as independent thinkers, don't we? But in reality, by nature, we're a product of the sea we swim in. We go with the status quo. The world leads and we blindly follow. It might be a, a trite example, but I, I noticed something this week. I was walking around Lister Park, which is the park near to our house, and, and, I, and I just was kind of people watching as you do in parks. And I noticed that every single adult I saw who was sitting down, you know, there were different ages, there were different cultures, different ways of life. Every single adult was doing the same thing. They were just looking down at their phone. You know, as much as we like to think with these free, independent thinkers, we follow the ways of the world, don't we? And, and that's because actually the world isn't neutral ground. The ruler of the kingdom of this air that this passage talks about is Satan. See, the Bible's very clear that the spiritual realm is real and it's powerful. So we might like to think of ourselves as free, but actually, the Bible says every human being has a master. And if it's not the living God, then it's the devil who has a hold over us, whether we realize that or not. And then there's the flesh, you know, our corrupted desires and cravings. And again, this is the complete opposite of our culture, isn't it? Our culture today says that we get liberty if we ignore God and we satisfy our desires, whatever those desires might be. The Bible says it's completely the other way around. Actually, liberation comes when we can say no to the desires of our flesh. Actually, by nature, all those desires, corrupt desires within us, enslave us. They direct our every move. They force us to pander to their whims. So dead, enslaved, and then condemned. We read in verse 3, by nature we're deserving of wrath. I guess up to now, it might have sounded a bit like we're somehow a victim in all this. But the reality is we're very actively involved. Our unresponsiveness to God is not morally neutral. He's our creator. He deserves our thanks and our praise. He, he takes our rebellion seriously. I think many people like to think that God kind of owes them something. You know, God's somehow in our debt in some way. He owes us some blessing. He owes us a good life. The reality is, it's we, are, it's we who are in debt. And all that God owes us, actually, is his judgment, his wrath, his right and settled anger against our rebellion. Now, this isn't easy, is it? And I think when we realize this for the first time, it, it kind of hits us like a smack in the face. It's like the person who, who opens the letter from the hospital to, to read that they have advanced pancreatic cancer and only months left to live. But actually, you see, we sit under similar condemnation by nature, awaiting God's righteous judgment. 
Or think of, think of the man you know, in a cell on death row. He might continue to get up each day, eat his meals, put his clothes on, but his fate is sealed, isn't it? Well, like him, by nature, we're condemned. Now, this is quite an assessment of humanity. Dead, enslaved, condemned. It's not comfortable. Why would I choose to speak about this at a baptism service? Why does the Apostle Paul include this in his letter? Well, here's why. We will never understand the story of grace until we get the starting point right. We will never appreciate what God has done through Jesus until we realize the nature of our situation before God. So often we assume we're worthy. We deserve God's blessing. And as a result, we're a bit disappointed in God. The reality is we are unworthy. We deserve God's wrath. And that changes our attitude, doesn't it? (laughs) Suddenly we're crying out to God for help. Suddenly we're overwhelmed in gratitude. Think again of that person who receives the letter, the diagnosis of cancer. We, We might not like it, but actually until we face it, we're never going to get help, are we? We're never going to address the situation. And it's exactly the same spiritually. Until we face this reality, we will never get our heads around who Jesus is. We'll never get a hold of grace. We'll never reach out to him for the help he offers. Now this, what I've just shared, that could be the end of the story, couldn't it? Normally it is. Dead people normally end up buried. Those who are enslaved normally live their life in chains. Those who are condemned normally face the punishment they deserve. That could be it. But it isn't it. Why not? Well, listen to to how verse 4 begins. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in our transgressions. But God. You know, the, the reason that spiritual death doesn't have to be the end of our story is entirely because of God's initiative. And it starts in God's heart. If it weren't for God's love, if it weren't for God's mercy, then all of us would remain spiritually dead. So so how has God done that? You know, how has he taken men and women who are dead and enslaved and condemned? How has he made us alive? Well, the answer is a person. Jesus Christ. The second thing we see in these verses is that in Christ, we are made alive. So this morning we're celebrating, aren't we, the work that God has done in the lives of Martin and Hamed and Saba and Maziar and Mustafa. That that he has made them spiritually alive. Now how do they have spiritual life? Well, it's because by faith they have taken hold of Jesus Christ. Remember um, Timothy John Weeks, the guy who was um, in, in, in captivity in Afghanistan. He was released through a prisoner swap. And our release from captivity comes also through a great swap as Jesus, the innocent one, takes our place. See, at the cross, Jesus wasn't just facing the physical pain of crucifixion. He faced the wrath of God. The sky went dark. He faced the right anger of God. Now, that wasn't for his rebellion. He was innocent. He faced God's right anger that should have been directed at us. He soaked it up so that we could be released. He was condemned so that our slate could be wiped clean. See, it's only in Jesus that this huge barrier of our sin, cutting us off from God and his life, can be dealt with. And with this barrier removed, as we trust in Christ, something remarkable happens. God's spirit begins to breathe life into us. You know, John chapter 3 um, it, talks, it talks of that as a new birth. You know, born, being born again, not in a physical sense, but spiritually. You know, think about how that team of four medics brought Fabrice Mwamba's lifeless body to life. Well, even more remarkably, God, by his spirit, brings life to us where there was death. You know, I think I remember the first time that I met Martin, um, and God had really been at work in his life, and he, he showed me, Um, a notebook full of Bible verses, you know, full of ways in which the Lord was speaking to him. Um, And that's remarkable, isn't it? You know, that's God's work in our lives. You know, um, 
knowing a bit of Martin's story, you know, previously had no time for God. But now, by God's Spirit, he's alive, aware of God, speaking to him through the Bible, treasuring God's words, allowing himself to be directed by God. It's, it's like a, a blind man suddenly being able to see. See, in Christ, suddenly that, that main dimension of our lives is opened up and we can respond to the God who made us. And it's not actually just that we've been made alive. So listen to how um, this continues in verse 6. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. See, to become a Christian is to be identified with Christ, to be in Christ, united with him. And there is a sense because of that that we are already exalted with Christ in the heavenly realms. But what, but what does that mean? That's one of those phrases that's hard to get our head around, isn't it? Well, let me use an illustration. It's a football illustration. Mazzi is a footballer who was uh, baptised this morning. Okay, we, you know, the transfer market's just been running, hasn't it? And just imagine a transfer that's taking place. Um, so there's a footballer, maybe they're, they're playing for a club in Germany, and they've signed for a Premier League club. Well, it might, you know, as soon as that contract is signed, it might still be a few weeks, mightn't it, before they move over to whatever city it is in the UK. But as soon as that contract is signed, they already begin to enjoy the status and the privilege, don't they, of their new club. You know, I expect already there's, there's names being printed on shirts ready for their arrival. In the dressing room, there's a seat with their name on it, already there, waiting for them to come. So they might not be there yet, but they already begin to enjoy that. And it, it's as if it's the same for us in Christ. You know, it's as if in heaven there's already a throne with our name on it. Actually, that, you know, we're already there in, in part. That's how significant our identity in Christ is. Part of us is already there with him. And actually, we already enjoy something of that status and that privilege today. And, and the fact that we're raised up with Christ, we saw last week, didn't we, that, that Christ is over every other power. That means actually we don't need to fear in this world. We're no longer enslaved. We're raised with him. So for those of you who've been baptised, you know, often the, the, you know, the trials will come. Often you'll face the opposition of the evil one. There'll be temptation in the weeks ahead. But you don't need to fear that because you are raised up with Christ. And actually he is more powerful than any of the things which might come against you. And baptism itself is a, a lovely picture, isn't it, of that union, that joining with Christ. You know, as, as these five were baptised, they identified with Christ in his death and resurrection. The old self dies, and we are raised with him. So we're made alive in Christ. And lastly, Paul draws a conclusion. We've seen the problem, we've seen the solution and he draws a conclusion in verses 8 to 10, which is that we're saved by grace. And it's inescapable, isn't it? Look at verse 8. For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. Grace means gift, you know, it's there in these verses. And the point is this, our salvation, our spiritual life, is entirely God's doing. It's not a reward for our hard work. It's a gift that we don't deserve. I think a lot of people assume that Christianity is works-based. That's how pretty much every religious system works, isn't it? And actually, if you look in the world around us, they recommend self-help. And people imagine that my job, if you like, is to tell everyone to live good lives, and if we do a half-decent job at that, well, God will reward us at the end. I hope, from what we've been looking at this morning you can see the folly in that. We're spiritually dead. How can we help ourselves? You know, works-based religion is like standing over Fabrice Mwamba, out cold on the grass, and saying, come on, Fabrice, get up. Come on, up you get. You can do it. I believe in you. It's foolish, isn't it? You know, if we have spiritual life, it's because God has saved us. Becoming a Christian involves God raising the dead. And this is why this baptism service this morning couldn't be any more different from a graduation. A graduation is the celebration of someone's achievement. You know, after years of hard work, they're recognised for what they have done. 
But this morning is not about what Martin or Hamed or Saba or Mazia or Mustafa has done. This morning is about what God has done. In Christ, God has made them alive and raised them up and seated them in the heavenly realms. And wonderfully, Ephesians 2 says that grace doesn't stop when we become a Christian. So look at verse 10. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. I think sometimes we think, look, I get that. You know, when we are converted, when we come, come to know the Lord, it's all by grace. But then we kind of imagine, as soon as we step into the Christian life, well, now it's on us. You know, now I've got to work really hard at this stuff. Now I've got to sort my life out of my own accord. But that's nonsense. You know, grace is the gate through which we enter the Christian life, but it's also the path on which we walk. And this verse says, look, we've been saved for a purpose. You know, for for the five who've been baptised, this isn't the end of the story, this is the beginning. God's just getting going in your lives. Uh, if, uh, those of you who know Martin know that he likes to make things. And uh, if you ever see Martin wearing a coat, it's probably one that he's made. It's, it's his handiwork. And he makes them for a purpose. He doesn't just make them to, to kind of sit there. He makes them to wear. And this verse is saying, we are God's handiwork. Isn't that a remarkable thought? And similarly, God has made us for a purpose. To do good works. So God has work for us to do if we're in Christ. And that's not a duty, that's not a kind of pressure, that's a wonderful opportunity. You know, when when someone creates something beautiful, what's our response? We give glory, don't we, to the artist, to the creator. You know, whether that's Martin for the co he's made, or or Monet for his painting, or Mozart for the symphony symphony he's written, we give glory, don't we, to the artist. So what should our response be this morning as we see these five getting baptised? What should our response be as we look around and we see God's work in our lives and each other's lives? Well, surely it's to give God glory for what he's done, for what he's made. One of the, um, you know, Zoom's changed all our lives, hasn't it, recently? And one of the dynamics you get in Zoom is you get these kind of carefully curated backdrops um, you know, I think all of us probably at home have a generally messy house with one spot that's immaculate, which is where we set our computers up for Zoom. And if you've, you know, on TV and stuff, as celebrities kind of connect on Zoom, often they've got these kind of shelves, haven't they, full of all the, the awards they want to show the world, all their trophies and Oscars and this kind of thing. Well, if you think about it like that, you know, what would God put on his shelves that he wants the world to see? Well, this passage says, actually, if we are in Christ, it's you and I. God would have us up on those shelves. Look at verse 7. He's made us alive in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. God would have us up on those shelves. His handiwork for everybody to see trophies of grace and it's not because we are fantastic you see as people see as the world sees on that day when we we are raised in glory as they see us they will not say Matthew what a great guy they will say God look at what you've done you know actually we get we give all the more credit don't we for creating something beautiful from difficult ingredients I was watching a, a Master Chef uh, program recently, and the way it worked, I think a chef was competing against one of the cont- you know, contestants or guests, uh, a professional chef against one of the guests, and, and there was a kind of bundle of food, and the, the guests got to pick the bits they want, and everything that was left, the chef had to use. So this chef got left with all the dud ingredients, you know, the bitter stuff, the awkward things, the unusual things. But what happened in that program is that still he created something beautiful, and tasty. And actually he was given all the more credit because of what he started with. And isn't that true with God? We're the awkward ingredients, aren't we? (laughs) And yet God, in his great power, makes something beautiful of us in Christ. So do you see on that final day, as, as we're unveiled in glory, the world, the watching world will see, look at God's grace. He took that 
and made that out of it in the Lord Jesus. Now, if we're believers, if we're those who are in Christ, this passage says there is no room for boasting, is there? There's no room for spiritual superiority. There's no room for looking down on a brother or sister in Christ as if they're some kind of second-class Christian. Because everything is of God. If it was left to us, we would still be dead and enslaved. You know, maybe we've been part of the church since we were born, and we know the songs and we know the names. Maybe we know lots about the Bible, and we kind of look down on those who get the answers wrong in the Bible study. Maybe our lives are all in order, and we're tempted to look down on those whose circumstances are more messy. How can we boast? Do you see how ugly it is? How inappropriate it is? How can we claim credit? We're we're the difficult ingredients. You know, more than bitter and awkward. Dead, enslaved, condemned. If there's any spiritual good in our lives, it's because of what God has done in Christ Jesus. Maybe this morning, as as you sit here uh, in the building or you're watching on YouTube, actually, you're not a believer. You know, as you've watched these five getting baptised, you know you haven't made that step in your own life. And maybe actually you long for the spiritual life that I'm talking about. You realise you need forgiveness and cleansing. Well, let me speak very plainly. The only way to spiritual life is through Jesus Christ, and it's received as a gift. Salvation comes only by grace. And actually, if still you don't get that, I suggest you start praying to ask God to make that clear. Think for a moment of a lifeboat. So there's a picture, I think, coming up. Often when we're on holiday, if we're by the coast, you know, we'll kind of pop in to a lifeboat station if we see them. And you kind of go into a place like this, don't you? And you, you have a look at the lifeboat there. And, it, you know, you might last there 10 or 15 minutes. It's kind of interesting. There are bits to read. But it, it feels like a museum, really. You know, you're not really personally affected by it. Um, it's worth a few minutes of your time. But it's a very different perspective, isn't it, if you're out at sea in need of a rescue, and if we go to the next picture, and you see a lifeboat coming. That's a different perspective. Now, amazingly, as I found looking for pictures for this morning, this lifeboat is called Grace, which is quite a wonderful thing, isn't it, to remind us of, of what we're talking about. Now, when we were on holiday um, in the summer in, in Wales, this, we actually saw a lifeboat rescue some people. So we were there on the beach, and all of a sudden... You know, a lifeboat pulls in um, and, and, and then a landing craft comes in with these people who'd kind of been on um, uh, paddle boards and had just drifted around the shore to where they couldn't get back. Now, when I watched them get onto the beach and hug their loved ones, their interaction with the lifeboat was very different, wasn't it? <laughs> they weren't apathetic. So it, it can be easy as you watch a baptism or something like this to be a bit like being in that lifeboat station where it's kind of interesting but you don't get why it's a big deal. It doesn't really affect you personally. You see, we will only really get who the Lord Jesus is. We'll only really get grace when we realise we're in the sea and we're drowning and we can't help ourselves and we need a rescue from the Lord Jesus. So if you've come to see that this morning, I urge you, you know, like Martin and Hamed and Saba and Mazia and Mustafa, I urge you to come to Jesus for rescue because there's no other way to be saved. So you see how today actually is a celebration of God's remarkable power at work, raising the dead. Well, we've come to the end of um, our time. Um, Actually, if you've got children in the the groups, um, could I ask you to to just head out um, from the main hall or from the lounge and go and collect them from the car park? Um, we're going to have a time of uh, just a pause, and then I'll invite Anwin back up um, to, to finish leading, us, leading the service. Uh, let me pray for us, and then maybe we'll have just a pause to reflect uh, before we respond in song. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we, we praise you uh, for, for this part of your word. We thank you that you are honest about our situation. Lord, it's not comfortable to realize this, but Lord, we acknowledge that by nature, We are spiritually dead, enslaved, condemned. And Lord, we praise you that that doesn't have to be the end of the story. We praise you, Lord God, for the work that you've done in our lives. We praise you for the work you've done in these five. 
Lord, we praise you that you've made, alive, made us alive in Christ. And Lord, as we, as we bear witness to that this morning, we recognize that that is all you're doing. Lord, it is a gift from you. We thank you that you continue to pour out your grace upon us. And so we pray, Lord God, this morning as we reflect, we pray that we will give you the glory, give you the praise that you deserve. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's just have a moment's pause. Um, and then... Uh, that the musicians are going to lead us in song.